Hello and welcome to Insight of Thalmology. This is Dr. Amrit welcoming you to another lecture in Conjunctiva. So what to expect from this video? Today we shall be discussing about what is conjunctivitis, what are the symptoms of conjunctivitis, what are the various signs we see in conjunctivitis, what are the various conjunctival reactions that we see, basically differentiating between papillary and follicular conjunctivitis. Apart from that, we shall be discussing about some special type of conjunctivitis like the membranous conjunctivitis and the ligneous conjunctivitis. Apart from that, we shall be basically classifying the various types of conjunctivitis. So first of all, what is conjunctivitis? As the name suggests, it is the inflammation of the conjunctiva and in normal population or in general population, it is referred to as the red eye or the pink eye because of the reddish appearance it gives to the eyeball. Now, not every red eye is conjunctivitis. Okay, so here I would like to tell you what is the difference between hyperemia and conjunctivitis. So hyperemia is nothing but it is dilatation of the conjunctival blood vessels but without any exudation or cellular infiltration. So here the conjunctival vessels are just dilated but they are not leaking. Okay, so we can get hyperemia on exposure to smoke and smog. We can get hyperemia when the eyeballs are exp exposed to chemical fumes, when the eye is exposed to UV radiation and wet. However, conjunctivitis is not just dilatation of the conjunctival blood vessels, but apart from that, we will have conjunctival reaction. We will have leakage from those blood vessels. Therefore, we will have exudation. Cellular infiltration, that means all your inflammatory cells are going to come out from the blood vessels into the stroma of the conjunctiva. And along with that, we might also see chemosis. Okay. Now, let's talk about how do you classify conjunctivitis or in simpler terms, what are the various types of conjunctivitis? Conjunctiv conjunctivitis can basically be classified as infectious or non infectious. Apart from that, we can classify conjunctivitis based on the chronicity of the disease. That means, if we say that a particular conjunctivitis is acute conjunctivitis, it means that it comes very early and resolves in less than four weeks duration. Okay, so here the cutoff point is four weeks. Chronic conjunctivitis is a conjunctivitis which lasts for more than four weeks. So what are the examples of chronic conjunctivitis? Usually the chronic conjunctivitis is seen in inflammatory conjunctivitis. So whenever there is some systemic inflammatory disorder and that is causing conjunctivitis, it usually causes a chronic sort of a disease. The reason is systemic diseases will take time to resolve and therefore cause chronic conjunctivitis. Apart from that, we have angular conjunctivitis. So that is also a chronic form of conjunctivitis because the organism takes a lot of time to uh, get treated. Now, other types of follicular conjunctivitis like trachoma, trachoma and various types of granulomatous conjunctivitis are also considered to be chronic by nature. Now, we can also divide the infective conjunctivitis based on the etiology of the disease. So, we can have bacterial conjunctivitis if bacteria is a causative agent. We can have viral conjunctivitis if virus is causing the conjunctivitis. We can have chlamydial or we can have fungal conjunctivitis. Okay, so all these are basically types of infective conjunctivitis, but based on the etiology. Now, another conjunctivitis is the allergic conjunctivitis, where the etiology is basically the allergy. Okay, and this is uh, basically a type of non-infective conjunctivitis. Now, conjunctivitis, we can also divide it based on the type of discharge that we see. Okay, so sometimes the discharge can be very thin, serous or watery like. That means it resembles your water, right? 
So whenever the discharge is watery, the etiology that you have to think about is acute viral conjunctivitis or acute allergic conjunctivitis. Okay. So what I mean to say is that in acute viral conjunctivitis or an acute allergic conjunctivitis, you will have watery discharge. Now, sometimes the discharge can be a mucoid discharge. That means the discharge will resemble mucus. Okay. Now, this is seen in case of chronic allergic conjunctivitis and also in case of dry eye disease. Right. Now, coming to mucopurulent discharge. That means the discharge is partly pus and partly mucin. Right. So, this is seen in case of chlamydial infection and in case of other bacterial infections. And again, you have moderately purulent discharge. That means it is basically a pus-like discharge and it is seen in case of acute bacterial conjunctivitis. Now, in some cases, you, you will have a lot of pussy discharge, which is called a severe purulent discharge. And that is basically seen in case of gonococcal infection. Now, here there's one more term that I would like to introduce you to is the hyperacute conjunctivitis. Okay. So it is believed that the gonococcal infection basically spreads really fast and it occurs, it, um, it spreads really fast and it has lots and lots of copious purulent discharge coming out of the eyes and therefore it is also called as the hyperacute conjunctivitis. Okay, so hyperacute conjunctivitis basically is a term which is used for gonococcal conjunctivitis. So that is what you should remember. Now, in this picture, you can see in the first one, you can see the discharge is basically watery. So it is just like, you know, hyper lacrimation. And such a discharge is seen in case of acute viral and acute allergic conjunctivitis. Once the allergy becomes chronic, you will have a mucoid type of discharge. In the second picture here, you can see that there is discharge and the discharge has actually, you know, this looks like a moderate uh, discharge and the discharge has actually dried up. Okay, and has caused crusting and matting of the eyelashes. And in third case also, you can see this purulent sort of discharge, which is causing sticking of the eyelashes together or matting of the eyelashes together. Now, this is a very common uh, symptom that the patient tells you that whenever they wake up in the morning, they will have sticking up of the eyelashes. So, they will have difficulty in opening the eye, uh, eyelashes or the eyelids. Now, this picture over here shows you the gonococcal conjunctivitis in which we will have severely purulent discharge. So, you can see in the first picture, the child has lots and lots of purulent discharge. And the second as well, you can see severe sort of inflammation with lid edema. And, uh, you know, you can see the eyes really red, uh, chemosed, and there is exudation and lots and lots of purulent discharge. So this is also a case of gonococcal conjunctivitis. It spreads really rapidly and it can actually involve the cornea as well. Based on the morphological response of the conjunctiva to the causative agent. Now the causative agent here could be infectious or it could be non-infectious, right? So whenever such a stimulus comes to the conjunctiva, the conjunctiva will basically show a response by changing the morphology of the conjunctiva. Now based on the morphological response or the change that you see in the conjunctiva, conjunctivitis can further be divided into different types. So we have papillary conjunctivitis, we have follicular conjunctivitis, we have membranous and pseudomembranous conjunctivitis, we have cicatrizing conjunctivitis in which, which, in which you will basically see more amount of fibrosis and then we also have a granulomatous conjunctivitis. Okay, so we shall be studying about each one of them in detail in the later part of the video. Now let us talk about what are the various symptoms of conjunctivitis? So basically patients will have first of all non-specific symptoms like they will complain of lacrimation and in patient's term they will say excessive watering of the eyes. Okay. Now because of those conjunctival reactions we will see grittiness in the eye that means foreign body sensation as if something has fallen inside the eye they will give that um, complain there will be stinging and burning sensation as well 
okay now usually the pain in conjunctivitis is not as severe as a pain in keratitis okay so if a patient with conjunctivitis if a patient with suspected conjunctivitis if you see marked amount of pain along with severe photophobia that the patient is not able to open his eyes and very severe foreign body sensation along with pain it basically suggests that you are dealing with a highly virulent organism and now it is not just conjunctivitis it might be actually keratoconjunctivitis that means your cornea might also uh, be involved in such a case now another important symptom is that of itching sometimes the patient will actually complain of itching so whenever you see a patient with a conjunctivitis like picture that means redness and there is itching you actually have to think about three conditions the first condition that you have to think and the most common one is the allergic conjunctivitis okay so usually in allergy there will be marked amount of itching so that happens because of the mast cell response okay now apart from that itching will also be present in patients who have blepharitis that means some sort of infection in the eyelid and when that infection of the eyelid spreads to conjunctiva it is called blepharoconjunctivitis okay now apart from that even patients with dry eye syndromes will have itching now another thing you should remember is that usually the visual acuity will not be affected in conjunctivitis so if there's a patient with conjunctivitis and he actually has drop in the visual acuity you have to again think in terms of corneal involvement or any other pathology maybe uveitis now the question is can you see colored halos in case of conjunctivitis like what you see in case of glaucoma in acute congestive glaucoma the answer is yes so you can see colored halos in case of conjunctivitis so what happens in conjunctivitis is that we see these mucopus and pus everywhere in the fornix and these flakes of muco mucus can actually come across the cornea and when they come across the cornea they can cause a prismatic effect and give give rise to these colored halos so colored halos is nothing but these rainbow colors that you're going to see around a light so the patient might complain that whenever he looks at a source of light he actually sees uh, this rainbow uh, in a circular form around that light source so that is called a colored halo so it's very important you differentiate whether you are dealing with the colored halos because of conjunctivitis or are you dealing with the colored halo of glaucoma because both of them are going to present with redness of the eyeball okay so the basic reason here is the flakes of mucus passing across the cornea causing the prismatic effect coming to the various signs that you see in conjunctivitis so the conjunctiva can show a lot of response so we can have either hyperemia okay we can have what you say hemorrhage in the conjunctiva we can have chemosis in the conjunctiva we can have follicle formation papillae formation granulomatous form uh, the granuloma formation which is called granulomatous reaction or the conjunctiva can actually undergo fibrosis or cicatrix formation right so now let us try to understand each of uh, these one by one so the first reaction that we are going to study about is the hyperemia now i already told you hyperemia is basically nothing but the dilatation of the blood vessels so obviously in conjunctivitis you will have hyperemic vessels along with that you will have exudation so because of the hyperemia the conjunctiva will look diffuse beefy red or pinkish in color and this hyperemia is much more towards the fornix and fades towards the limbus so that is when uh, one very important point which is used to differentiate it from the ciliary injection right so here this redness what you see is called the conjunctival injection so conjunctival injection is nothing but it is hyperemia of the conjunctiva which is more towards the fornices and as you reach the limbus it is basically decreasing in its intensity however the ciliary injection of the iridocyclitis which is also called the ciliary flush or the circumciliary congestion abbreviated as ccc will be more around the limbus and will actually decrease in its intensity towards the fornix so now i already have a video in the on the channel in which i talk in detail about differential diagnosis of red eyes that means conjunctivitis versus uveitis versus the acute angle closure glaucoma so i will put a link in the description box as well as also you will see a Uh, i button on top uh, uh, at this time stamp of the video where you can click and access the video
the next conjunctival reaction is sometimes you will have hemorrhage associated with the conjunctiva okay now you this hemorrhages can be of different morphology sometimes you will have just you know dot blot sort of hemorrhages multiple small discrete hemorrhages these are called petechial hemorrhages which are more common in case of viral etiology okay otherwise sometimes you will also see a larger diffuse sort of uh, hemorrhage which is more common in case of bacterial conjunctivitis but that is seen in case of severe bacterial conjunctivitis not your normal conjunctivitis okay so if you see the, uh, these petechial hemorrhages in the palpable conjunctiva you have to think about viral etiology okay so that is one important clinical point the next reaction is chemosis chemosis is nothing but it is also called as the conjunctival edema so basically this is its collection of the fluid within the conjunctiva and it will be seen as a translucent swelling sometimes the swelling will be so much that the conjunctiva will actually protrude beyond the eyelid margin as well okay now where do you see chemosis in case of conjunctivitis you basically see chemosis in acute hypersensitive uh, hypersensitivity response example in case of pollen so what i mean to say is you will see these chemosis basically in case of allergic conjunctivitis however sometimes in severe infective conjunctivitis also you might see chemosis but mainly such sort of uh, picture you will have in case of acute hypersensitivity reaction or in case of allergic conjunctivitis of course in this picture you don't see much of hyperemia but this picture i've put here to show you marked amount of chemosis that is seen in this ad now this would be the correct time to differentiate between papillary reaction and a follicular reaction before we actually jump into the detailed explanation i would like you to observe these diagrams the first picture is that of a papillae and the second picture is that of a follicle now if you see carefully observe the location of the blood vessels in case of a papillae the blood vessel is actually present right at the center of that elevated growth and then it's spreading towards the periphery right and if you look at the follicle the blood vessel is present actually in the periphery and the center is clear of this fibrovascular growth okay so both of these are elevated lesions however in a papillae you will have a central vascular core whereas in case of a follicle you will not have a central vascular core apart from that both are elevated both are covered uh, superiorly with the conjunctival epithelium and in the sub epithelial area you have lymphocytes and other leukocyte accumulation so first let us talk about the papillae as i told you in contrast to follicles papillae will usually have a vascular core that is present now based on the size you will have different types of papillae you will have a micro papilla or a macro papilla if the size is less than 1 mm it is called a micro papillae if the size is greater than 1 mm it is called a macro papillae now a micro papillae will actually just look like a mosaic pattern of elevated red dots it is looking as red dots because of that central vascular channel macro papillae are the papillae which are much more greater in size and you will see them with prolonged inflammation sometimes they will become even more enlarged and that uh, those papillae are called a giant papillae or the giant papillary reaction now the tip of the papilla usually will take up stain with the fluorescein and sometimes you can also see the presence of mucus if the papillae are really active now papillae can also be seen around the limbus not just at the tarsal conjunctiva and in my previous video on the anatomy of conjunctiva i told you why do you see papillae at the limbus and not in the scleral conjunctiva okay so the limbal papillae will actually have a gelatinous appearance so here you can see actually giant papillae these are really big amount of you know big size uh, big sized papillae in the first picture also there is papillae which are present these are probably the macro papillae here it is more clear you can see these papillae and just look at the arrangement of these so they seem to be covering the entire tarsal conjunctiva in the upper eyelid and it is this first picture actually gives you an appearance of a uh, how a pavement looks right so this is called a cobble cobblestone appearance and these papillae are actually arranged in such a way as the stones are arranged on that pavement and therefore this is called a cobblestone appearance of the papillae then papillae can also be seen around the limbus you can see 
these are whitish in appearance they look as if you know they have some sort of mucoid appearance or pearly appearance to them and therefore this is called a gelatinous appearance of the limbal papillae so papillae can basically develop only in the palpable conjunctiva that is in your tarsal conjunctiva and in the limbal bulbar conjunctiva where it is attached to the deeper fibrous layer basically wherever your conjunctiva is strongly adhered to the underlying uh, tissue only at that place you will see development of the papillae so that is a very important point coming to the histology so what exactly is papilla made up of so you will basically see this hyperplastic epithelium so all this dark purple color is your you know hyperplastic epithelium hyperplasia is nothing but increase in the number of cells so that is what we see in papillae so this epithelium is thrown into this finger like projection and below the epithelium you see various blood vessels that's called a fibrovascular core along with that all these are the cells so these cells are the stromal infiltration of the inflammatory cell okay this is what you see in the early papilla later at the later stage what happens is that hyalinization will start scarring will start these inflammatory this inflammatory accumulation which was initially an acute inflammation will now go towards chronic inflammation so now you will have scarring apart from that you will see some crypts formation here and there will be also goblet cells which will be present in that crypt so when the goblet cells start increasing in their number you will have more amount of mucoid secretion from this papillae now the question is that we have studied so much about the papillae but what is the clinical significance where do you actually see papillary conjunctivitis so the idea here is that if you see presence of papillae in a patient of conjunctivitis you have to think about certain etiology so you see papillae in acute bacterial conjunctivitis so various bacterial pathologies there will be papillae present and particularly in allergic conjunctivitis you are going to see papillae specifically in atopic keratoconjunctivitis and vernal keratoconjunctivitis then you can also see papillae in superior limbic conjunctivitis in floppy eyelid syndrome then papillary formation can also be seen in reaction to a foreign body or toxin which is present in the eye so sometimes patients who wear contact lens they can show papillary reaction in their conjunctiva now this gpc is nothing but giant papillary conjunctivitis okay so in all these conditions where gpc is written you will actually see presence of really large papillae then you have a mucus fishing syndrome in which the patient has a bad habit of you know um fishing for his mucus plug so he keeps on removing those mucus plug from his eye from his eye continuously and that leads to that actually aggravates further mucus production and the patient keeps on removing it right so that can also leads to papillary conjunctivitis then in keratoconjunctivitis sicca which is called dry eye you can have papillary conjunctivitis in blepharoconjunctivitis as well that is conjunctivitis associated with blepharitis you can have papillary conjunctivitis now if you if you have to remember it just remember that in bacterial conjunctivitis you will see papillary formation in allergic conjunctivitis you will see papillary formation and you will see papillae formation wherever there is a foreign substance okay so in case of the foreign body you will definitely see a papillary reaction contact lens also can act as a foreign body you can think it as a foreign body so there will be giant papillary reaction in floppy eyelid disease because the eyelid is has lost its tone and it comes in contact with the uh, you know surface when the patient lies down so, uh, in a prone position so that can act as a a uh, foreign body so you can imagine like that and you can you know remember that floppy eyelid syndrome also can lead to papillary conjunctivitis mucus fishing syndrome because the patient is constantly you know irritating the eye and there is an irritant and the patient here itself is irritating the eye by you know keeping on uh, pulling the mucus plugs outside so that can also cause papillary conjunctivitis dry eye obviously and blepharoconjunctivitis you have this a uh, blepharitis component in which the tear film is definitely affected so obviously there will be irritation to the eye and that can again lead to a papillae formation now coming to, uh, to the follicles so as i told you that follicles will have the conjunctival blood vessels present along the periphery of the follicles right so these follicles are actually multiple discrete 
and slightly elevated lesions okay so you will have multiple lesions they're slightly elevated but what is important is that they look like translucent grains of rice so whitish lesions which will look like grains of rice right sometimes white sometimes yellowish white but they are more common in the furnaces the reason why for they're common in furnaces is that if i told you in my previous video that the lymphoid tissue is present maximally in the the uh, furnaceal area the lymphoid layer is thickest in the furnaceal area and therefore you see maximum amount of follicles also in the furnaces area so as i told you these are actually these translucent grains of like you know whitish appearances okay so these are the follicles as you can see here now usually you will see follicles in the lower eyelid okay however there is one condition which uh, that is trachoma in which follicles are more numerous on the upper palpebral conjunctiva so much so that whenever you see follicle in the upper eyelid you have to actually suspect trachoma okay so follicles can uh, are usually seen in the lower eyelid in other conditions coming to histology follicles basically will show a sub epithelial lymphoid germinal center so you can see this lymphoid follicle formation in which you have the immature lymphocytes in the center and then you have the mature lymphocytes in the periphery again here you can see multiple follicles you can see here these are the whitish translucent you know uh, just like rice the appearance is like that of rice so these are follicles again you can see follicles here with the shiny reflex from the slit lamp okay and here in the second picture you can actually see this petticle hemorrhages also which tells that maybe you are actually dealing with a viral etiology now i told you that in the bacterial uh, conjunctivitis you will see papillary reaction but in case of viral conjunctivitis you will see a follicular reaction that is why i have put this picture here to show you that petticle and follicles can coexist and when you see that you should think in terms of viral etiology now another important clinical point is that the conjunctiva of a newborn baby is actually unable to form a follicle before 2 to 3 months of age okay so if any infection occurs however in a child whether it is viral etiology or bacterial etiology in the early life will actually happen as a papillary conjunctivitis for it to develop into follicular conjunctivitis the infection has to remain active for longer than 3 months so that is very very important so what are the causes of follicular conjunctivitis so the causes of follicular conjunctivitis can be classified into acute follicular conjunctivitis and chronic follicular conjunctivitis so in acute follicular conjunctivitis acute means that disease is less than 4 weeks old and you have follicular reaction so this is seen in case of inclusion conjunctivitis which happens because of chlamydia then the virus etiology adenoviral conjunctivitis which can cause pharyngo conjunctival fever epidemic keratoconjunctivitis conjunctivitis then you have newcastle disease influenza herpes zoster and herpes simplex now if you can actually observe here that the causative agents of acute follicular conjunctivitis are mainly the viruses what about the causes of chronic follicular conjunctivitis so chronic follicular conjunctivitis can occur in response to certain medications and toxins okay so their papillary reaction was occurring in response to a foreign body but in response to a medication you will have a chronic follicular conjunctivitis okay so uh also to tell you that in chronic allergy also sometimes you can have follicular reaction again in inclusion conjunctivitis chlamydia can actually become chronic as well so that in that case you will see chronic follicular reaction in morixella which causes angular conjunctivitis you can have follicular uh, reaction in folliculosis in molluscum contagiosum lyme disease pediculosis your cat scratch disease which is called perinodes ocular glandular syndrome you can see follicles now in cat scratch fever or perinodes ocular glandular syndrome you can also see a granuloma formation so you can also have this granulomatous sort of uh, conjunctivitis then in trachoma as well in which you will specifically see these follicles in the upper eyelid now not always you have to treat the follicles so follicles can also be benign example in benign folliculosis also called school folliculosis 
it basically affects school children as a part of generalized lymphoid hyperplasia now what happens in school going kids is that they actually normally have this lymphoid uh, tissue hyperactivity they have this hyperplasia of the lymphoid tissue in the upper respiratory tract like they will have enlargement of the tonsils and that of the adenoids so similarly they can also have this hyperplasia of the uh, the lymphocytes or the lymphoid tissue which is present in the conjunctiva so this is called benign folliculosis of the childhood okay so here you will have these follicles really very large follicles which are arranged in parallel rows usually in the lower conjunctiva and you will not see much amount of hyperemia so as i told you these follicles are a normal finding in childhood which is called benign folliculosis apart from that in adults if you find follicles in the fornices that might also be normal and at the margin of the upper tarsal plate also it is normal this is a picture to show you that there is actually this is actually a patient affected with uh, the lice infestation so you can see this uh, eggs on the lashes and louse uh, with human blood filling its digestive system now in the first picture in the picture a you can actually see the follicular reaction now after we have studied about papillae and follicles now let us go to membranes so in membranes we have true membrane and a pseudo membrane the question is how do you differentiate between a true membrane and a pseudo membrane so first of all what is a true membrane a true membrane is basically a membrane that involves the superficial layer of conjunctival epithelium okay now this superficial layers of the conjunctival epithelium as the epithelium itself is involved in case of a true membrane when you try to remove this true membrane obviously there will be tearing and bleeding because the epithelium is actually separating from the underlying substantia propria however a pseudo membrane is just a coagulated exudate okay it is nothing but it is not really the epithelium which is affected in pseudo membrane here it is actually just the exudates which are leaking in conjunctivitis those are getting accumulated coagulated and they are forming that membrane which is adherent on top of the conjunctival epithelium so it's more like the epithelium itself becomes the membrane in true membrane but in pseudo membrane you have a separate membrane sitting on top of the conjunctival epithelium so when you are going to peel that pseudo membrane there will be an intact underlying epithelium and you will not see any sort of bleeding or tearing so that is very one very much important point to remember now in the first picture you can actually see a true membrane as you can see the membrane has actually involved the entire epithelium and when you are peeling a true membrane you are actually peeling the epithelium of the substantia propria and therefore there will be underlying bleeding whereas in case of a pseudo membrane pseudo membrane nothing but it's a coagulated membrane sitting on top of the epithelium so if you are going to peel this membrane you are peeling just the membrane and the epithelium is intact and there is no bleeding below a pseudo membrane right now here you can see these membranes okay the pictures so this is the first one okay and this is the second one now the thing is that by just by looking at the membrane you can't really tell whether you are dealing with a pseudo membrane or a true membrane you need to peel it off to see uh, whether you are dealing whether there's bleeding or there's no bleeding the thing is that even if you peel it off or not it will ultimately lead to scarring now what are the causes of membranous conjunctivitis now the membranous conjunctivitis causes are the various organisms like coronibacterium diphtheriae beta hemolytic streptococcus adenovirus also can lead to formation of membranes along with herpes simplex then various kinds of diseases ocular surface diseases which cause inflammatory chronic sort of conjunctivitis also the cicatricial conjunctivitis in which you will have this membrane so steven johnson syndrome toxic epidermolysis syndrome now there's one important organism which actually causes pseudo membranes okay and that is pneumococcus now especially when you're dealing with a pseudo membrane it is recommended that you actually peel the membrane okay not so much in case of a true membrane because then you will have significant amount of scarring and also bleeding and it's quite difficult sometimes to even stop that bleeding but in case of a pseudo membrane it is actually recommended that you peel that membrane because 
uh, that way you will prevent that membrane to contract over a period of time and as the membrane will contract it will lead to cicatricial conjunctivitis it will cause symblephron formation secondary infection and even it can lead to scarring of the cornea now when we're talking about pseudomembrane conjunctivitis there is a sort of disease in which you have genetic plasminogen deficiency so what happens is you will have recurrent pseudo membrane formation and this membrane is actually formed of fibrin deposits. So this fibrins which are getting deposited time and again in this patient will lead uh, to a pseudo membrane formation that has a very woody feeling to it. Okay, so there's a woody induration to these, membra uh, to these membranes and such a condition or such a conjunctivitis is called ligneous conjunctivitis and it happens because of the plasminogen deficiency now another type of conjunctival reaction is subconjunctival cicatrization or scarring so as i told you inflammation can become chronic and it can cause fibrotic changes leads to subconjunctival cicatrization this picture over here is actually showing you the uh, linear fibrotic line which is called the alts line which is seen in case of trachoma this cicatrization is seen in trachoma and there are other forms of conjunctivitis also. The thing is that when scarring occurs, your goblet cells are lost and also the accessory lacrimal glands are also lost. And ultimately, this so what are the various causes of cicatricial conjunctivitis? You can see it in case of ocular femphigoid. You can see in trachoma. Okay, then various connective tissue disorders, dermatitis herpetiformis, epidermolysis bullosa, Steven Johnson's and toxic epidermolysis neck, uh, syndrome, this you should remember, and exfoliative dermatitis. Coming to the granuloma formation, so sometimes there will be a type 4 hypersensitivity reaction surrounding some foreign body, so that can also present as conjunctivitis, it is called a granulomatous conjunctivitis, okay. So this hypersensitivity will present as a mass and along with that you will have this inflammation surrounding that. So it is seen in response to foreign body, sometimes allergens and sometimes there will be a systemic disease which can also cause a granulomatous reaction. Now. Systemic diseases which causes granulomatous reaction are some sort of infections like TB, okay, then perinodes oculoglandular syndrome because of cat scratch fever, tularemia, okay, then apart from that we have syphilis, we have sarcoid, we have granulomatous with polyangitis that's called Wegner's granulomatous disease and sometimes even ophthalmia nodosa which occurs because of, you know, some hair of caterpillar which is lodged into the eye and around surrounding that you will see granulomatous reaction. Hodgkin lymphoma can also present as granulomatous uh, conjunctivitis and sarcoidosis and syphilis as I mentioned. One more feature is lymphadenopathy. Now, as I told you that conjunctiva basically drains into which group of lymph nodes? It drains basically into the preauricular group of the lymph nodes laterally and the submandibular group of lymph nodes, basically the medial part of the conjunctiva. So the most common cause of lymphadenopathy, that is inflammation of the lymph nodes sometimes, okay, you can see. So the most common uh, causes are viral infections, chlamydial infections, perinodes ocular glandular syndromes and severe bacterial infections like the uh, gonococcal conjunctivitis. The preauricular site is typically affected. So it's always important that you also do uh, a preliminary lymph node examination and sometimes here in this area you will see uh, enlarged lymph nodes and sometimes even in the submandibular area are you still watching did you like the video so if you did show your support to inside ophthalmology by liking the video leaving a comment and sharing this video with your friends if you do that it actually boosts up the youtube algorithm youtube actually promotes us and we can actually reach more number of people in the end develop insight become insightful and be a part of insight ophthalmology family don't forget to subscribe thank you and have a nice day